Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If Pastor Mize were here, he probably would get right up, march right up to this pulpit, and punch me in the face. As he said, he's heard this phrase so many times, he's positively sick of it, but I'm going to say it anyway. These are unprecedented times. <laughs> there have been plagues and pandemics before, but not in the lifetime of most of us currently living. I don't think there is any pastor on the roster of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod who has led his church through a pandemic, and this particular pastor has been on the sidelines for the past half year or so. On top of that, we're experiencing racial tensions and natural disasters. There's not much in the playbook to help us with this. And in the midst of a pandemic, we celebrate a physician. On October 18th, the church remembers St. Luke the Evangelist. The Augsburg Confession, the first and chief of the confessions contained in the Book of Concord says, our churches teach that the history of the saints may be set before us so that we may follow the example of their faith and good works according to our calling. Luke was the companion of St. Paul. The apostle calls him the beloved physician. From the earliest times, the church has identified Luke as the author of the third gospel and its companion volume, the Acts of the Apostles. The church has traditionally understood the sections of the book of Acts where the pronoun we is used to indicate the time when Luke was with Paul. He joined Paul on his second missionary journey as the apostle prepared to go into Macedonia. As Paul moved on to Thessalonica and Berea, Luke remained in the city of Philippi as pastor of the newly planted church. When Paul passed through Philippi on his way to Jerusalem to deliver the relief offering from the newly planted Gentile churches, Luke rejoined him. Luke's gospel and the book of Acts were carefully researched and written for a Gentile Christian convert named Theophilus. The appointed gospel for St. Luke's Day is the account of Jesus sending out the 72. Appropriately, it contains the charge to heal the sick and proclaim that the kingdom of God is near. But what does this gospel tell us about St. Luke? Not a lot. Lutheran liturgical scholar Fred Lindemann writes, perhaps this holy gospel was written because St. Luke was supposed to have been one of the 70, but there is not a shred of evidence for this. However, the evangelist begins his gospel with these words, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. St. Luke most likely talked to some of the 72, but still, you don't learn much about him. And St. Luke is fine with that. He would really rather we didn't think so much about him and thought more about his Lord Jesus Christ and the good news of Christ's death and resurrection for our salvation. So, what does this gospel tell us about ourselves? Ah, now that is a legitimate question. And it deserves a legitimate answer. 
But we're going to have to look deep into the text to find out. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. St. Matthew wrote his gospel to Jewish Christians. So he included the sending of the 12, 12 apostles for the 12 tribes of Israel. 70 is the number that represented the Gentile world. Luke is writing to a wealthy Christian convert. So he includes the sending of the 72 as a signal of the coming worldwide mission of Christ and his church. Also, notice that they're sent out two by two. The lone wolf Christian is a recent phenomenon with no scriptural basis. God calls and gathers us not as individual Christians who spend an hour in a room with other individual Christians to have a little me and Jesus time, but as a community gathered around his word and sacraments so we may draw strength from one another to live our faith day by day. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of harvest, that he may send out laborers into his harvest. The gathering of the harvest isn't somebody else's job. Christ is telling the 72, as they go gather the harvest, to pray for more workers right alongside them. Go your way. I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. We don't go out into the world as middle-class Americans in the midst of other middle-class Americans. We go as lambs in the midst of wolves. If the world is comfortable with us, what's wrong with that picture? Luther once remarked that if the Christian doesn't feel the attacks of Satan, he was probably sleeping at the Christian's feet like a little puppy dog. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. In other words, this is no time to stand around and yakety yak. There is work to be done. This time last year, when I was serving my little parish in rural Manitoba, I didn't see much of my parishioners who were farmers because they've been too busy harvesting. And in the past couple weeks, as I was on my rounds doing census work in rural Henderson County, what did I see? People out in the orchards picking apples. It's harvest time. That's the kind of urgency Christ is calling for here. If the harvest isn't gathered, it will die. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide. For the laborer deserves his wages. It was the practice of traveling Greek philosophers to set up shop in the first house that welcomed them, but leave if the house down the street had a better stock wine cellar or a swimming pool. Christ's gospel is to be given out free of charge, not sold to the highest bidder. Also, Luke is anticipating the Gentile mission when Jewish missionaries would find themselves with pork on the plate or something else that wasn't kosher. What do you do then? You eat it anyway. And now, here we are. Even as we, like turtles, begin to poke our heads out of our shells, public health experts still tell us to shelter in place as much as we can because we're safer at home, but the calls to shelter in place 
have not muted the gospel call. We may be called upon to harvest in new ways without leaving our homes, using inventions St. Luke never lived to see, but we're not given the option of putting our master on hold. Shelter in place or not, it's still harvest time. There was once a coastal town that had a lot of shipwrecks. To care for shipwreck survivors, some volunteers established a life-saving society. People so admired the work of the life-saving society that they wanted to be a part of it, even if they had no part of the life-saving work. Eventually, that life-saving society became a social club where members would gather for potluck dinners with potato salad and other munchies. They even had a ceremonial lifeboat for initiation rituals. Eventually, those who still cared about the work of saving shipwreck survivors were told to go start a group of their own. That town now has a couple dozen different social clubs. Shipwrecks still happen but now the people just die. The moral of that story is this. We're never better than when we're on mission. We're never better than, we're act than when we're acting as Christ would. We're never better than when Jesus is living through us. That's why we gather here, where Christ places himself into our ears in his word where he washes away our sins in baptismal waters and clothes us with himself, where he places himself into our very bodies in his true body and blood. As my old classmate, Pastor Jason Zerbel said, this thing that we call in-person worship is a very big deal to our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know why I saw all those apple pickers in Henderson County? because they're essential. The harvest has to be gathered before it dies. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Do you know what else I saw as I was driving around doing my census work? Road construction workers. I could count on having to see a flagman with his stop sign at least once a day. Oh yeah, they're essential too. The prophet Isaiah writes, and a highway shall be there, and its name shall be called the way of holiness. And again, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be on their heads. They shall come with everlasting joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The church remembers St. Luke on October 18th, but this is the Lord's day. This is the day we gather in the Lord's house to receive his gifts. The 72 were sent out to herald our Savior as he made his way to Jerusalem. Outside the city wall, he would die on a cross. On Easter Sunday, he rose from the dead. And now, as St. Luke and all the blessed have done, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes again. And I don't need to tell you twice how essential health care workers have been at this time. St. Luke was a physician. Christ is the great physician. There is nothing more essential than Christ and his healing gifts. Come, receive the healing he gives in his means of grace. Then get out there. It's harvest time. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.